Hello, everyone. I'm Eric D'Souza uh, for Crime Writers of Canada, and I've been having the privilege of interviewing all the shortlist candidates for our Awards of Excellence. And joining me today is crime writer from Ottawa, Canada, or Ottawa, Ontario, Amy Tector. How are you today, Amy? I'm great. Thanks, Eric. Um, I mentioned before, uh, I loved your bio so much that I'm pretty much just going to borrow it. <laughs> I think we borrow, right, in this industry? <laughs> so. That's exactly right. Amy Tector spent more than 20 years plumbing the secrets, squirreled away in archives. Whether uncovering a whale's ear in a box of old photographs or working in The Hague for the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for War Crimes in the former Yugoslavia, she has a privy of hidden records and extraordinary secrets. She now works for Canada's National Archives, Library and Archives Canada, and an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa and a um, secessional instructor at Carleton University. Amy's debut novel, The Honey Bee Emeralds, was published in the spring of 2022. Her second novel, The Foulest Thing, is the first in a loose trilogy centered on the murders and mayhem of archives nominated for, and nominated for Best Crime Novel Set in Canada. Uh, she already has another book, Hitting the Bookstores too, Speak of the Dead, and we're going to try to speak about all three of the books, but uh, we'll have to squeeze it in. Um, your Goodreads profile looks like a typo, and I know other people have mentioned that too, just because essentially three books in one year, uh, all coming out. Uh, I've already heard a little bit of your path to publication, and it's fascinating. It's a story of perseverance, um, and it's inspiring. So if you don't mind, I'm going to sit back, and can you tell us the story? <laughs> yes, sure. Uh, it, it is kind of a good one, I guess, although it didn't feel like a good one necessarily when I... <laughs> when I was being rejected over and over again. Um, but yeah, I, I've always been a reader and very shortly after you know learning how to read, I started writing. So I've also always been a writer. Um, and uh, in my twenties, I started to you know, um, get, get more serious about writing. And I, um, I found a really wonderful writing group, a critiquing group that was very supportive. And so I started um, writing novels and uh, the first the first novel that I that I wrote that I was really proud of um, was a murder mystery, and uh, and it, this was back in the day in the olden times. So I so I had to print it out, and and I was like, this book is really good. I'm gonna get it published. I'm so excited. Um, now I just need to find an agent, and then of course, just wait for the money to flow in. <laughs> and uh, so, like I said, it was the olden days. So you had to you had to actually print the thing out mail it with the stamp self-addressed envelopes and figure out how to send to the United States. It was very complicated. So, um, but I, I, I sent that novel out on submission all over the place and I wasn't successful with it. And that was really disappointing, especially because that novel had been shortlisted for the um, Unhanged Arthur, the, which now has a new name, I know, but uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so that was really disappointing, and I, um, you know, I tried probably for about a year, various, uh, you know, looking for agents, looking for publishers that accepted unagented, and I, I shelved it, and I went back to the drawing board, and I wrote another murder mystery, uh, and, and again, you know, it took me a few years because I was working full time and, you know, living my life, <laughs> and, um, and when that one was ready, I was I was really proud of that one, and I thought this this is the one that that I'm going to successfully get published. And so by then, um, uh, it was easier to submit. So I did the same thing, and I had my you know I had I, what I thought was a killer uh, query letter, and went and submitted to all the agents and the and the publishers the same thing. Got some good feedback, had some interest, but never uh, never landed it. So uh, that also. <laughs> Eventually, after probably again about a year, I was like, okay, I guess this one wasn't right. And so I shelved that guy. Uh, and then I wrote a third uh, novel. Uh, and this is sort of maybe now 2018. And this time I decided not to do a murder mystery because those hadn't been successful. And my, my first two novels had been set both in Ottawa uh, and had featured uh, lots of Canadians. And so this time I very deliberately and unpatriotically said, all right, I'm going to write a non- Canadian setting book and so I chose Paris because it's a wonderful location uh, and I was familiar with the city and and I very deliberately 
did not uh, have any Canadian characters in my story. And I just, I was just like, well, maybe, you know, maybe people need, maybe, maybe this is what I need to do to get published. So I did it. One character uh, in the Honeybee Emeralds, which is the, was, was, is the book I'm talking about, was, um, uh, she's from Vermont. And so in my head, she's actually, cause I'm from the Eastern townships, which is right on the border with Vermont. So in my head, she's actually from the townships and I just popped her over the border uh, to make her American. <laughs> anyway, my unpatriotic theories uh, proved correct because again, I was really proud of Honeybee Emeralds. Um, and I did the, the same thing, spent probably about nine months submitting again, had really good feedback from agents, but it wasn't quite right. There's, you know, everybody had some, some challenges. So at that point I was quite discouraged and I said to this agent who I was having some back and forth with who, who wasn't interested <laughs> after getting my hopes up everyone who's published knows that feeling um I said well I, I think I'm just shelved this one again like I'm, I'm getting quite good at shelving things that I love and believe in and she said well give it a give it a few more months and so I took that advice to heart and I was really pleased that I did that because I stopped submitting to agents and started going down my list of smaller publishers that accept unagented. And I, you know, fired off my, uh, this manuscript to um, Turner, uh, Turner Publishing, which has, and ha which has an imprint called Keylight, and they're based in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, within two weeks, I got a response from Turner, and it was the it was a very exciting email that then said, let's have a phone conversation. And it's the phone conversation that every would-be writer dreams of uh, because the, the editor I was talking to gushed about my book and she had read it and she had thought about it. And she was so excited and she had questions for me. And we had this amazing, you know, 35 minute conversation about the book. And it was the first time I had talked, anybody had read my book who sort of didn't love me already you know like I had a conversation with somebody about this book that I'd read who I wasn't related to and so that alone when I hung up the phone with my my uh, with her I said to my husband wow like if nothing else happens having had that conversation someone who was was excited about this thing that I've written was amazing uh but they Turner Keylight accepted that book and so that was Honey Bee Emeralds and uh, you know started all the work the exciting work of getting that thing published uh, and at some point in that relationship, I said to um, the editor, I was like, well, I've got these other two books that I've written uh, that I shelved, but I always thought they were really good and they just didn't find their spot. I said, do you want to see them? And I, and thinking, and she said, sure. And I thought, well, they'll, they'll want to publish one of them. And maybe, maybe they'll want to publish one of them. And I'm as, you know, I've established this relationship with these people. So it's already a foot in the door. And then lo and behold, um, they wanted both of them. And suddenly I went from having no books published to, like you said, I, I've, I've had three books published in essentially 12 months, uh, which is uh, incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still like, what the hell just <laughs> happened? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's the story of those, those three books in very rapid succession. And it's that sort of thing of, you know, those books in the, on the shelf that you, that you put away because you couldn't do anything with them. If you believe in them, you might be able to take them out. Um, so of those two books, um, which I believe are part of your uh, Dominion archive series, um, the first book, uh, I'm assuming, is the one that's nominated now, The, foul, the, the Foulest Things. Um, so you must have written that quite a while ago then. Yeah, so it's quite confusing. So The Honeybee Emeralds is a standalone book. It's not a murder mystery, but it is a mystery, and it involves... Mm -hmm people sort of tracking, tracking down beautiful jewels in Paris. Um, and then, then The Foulest Things is the uh, second book to be published and then Speak for the Dead, which is out now, um, yeah. is the third book to be published. And Foulest Things and Speak for the Dead are both part of the Dominion Archives uh, series that my publisher is now uh, marketing. So confusingly, The Honeybee Emeralds was the first, uh, was the first one published, but it's the last, last book. One written Fabulous Things is the first book I wrote way back in about 2000, 2006, 2007 was when I was writing it. I can't remember when I got nominated for the Unhanged, but it was in there sometime. Um, did you feel that you had to modernize the Fabulous Thing at all uh, to be the present day or did you sort of keep it in that time period? Because even though it doesn't sound that long ago, it was a different world. 
Yeah. And uh, it was interesting. I was floored when, when the publisher got back and said, yes, we'll take both of them. And then I was like, holy cow, like, how do I do this? Um, uh, and I went back, of course, and had another look at the foulest things and, and realized that it was out of date. Like it, I couldn't, I couldn't set it in 2022 and, and have it be reasonable because no one was using cell phones. There's a lot of conversation about uh, landlines and photocopying things. It, it is an exciting book. <laughs> it's not landlines and photocopying things, but the technology was wrong. The cultural references were wrong. You know, I mean, I don't think anybody, you know, knew about Lady Gaga then. So like, <laughs> right, like the people were talking about things that that were off and um, all my mysteries, I'm always interested in, in the historical. And so there were some historical elements that wouldn't have matched up if the book was set in present day, because then we'd be, it would be too long for things to have, too much time would have passed for things to make sense in the sort of denouement of the story. So um, I decided, I looked at it and thought, can I update this? How can I update this? How can I explain these, these story problems and how can I update everything? And instead I thought, no, I'll set this one in 2010. And um, so I had to do a, a rewrite because then I had to posit, I had to anchor it more in 2010 because it's a weird, it's a weird, it's weird to write a book in 2022 and set it in 2010 because it's not far enough back to be historical. Um, and so, uh, and I wanted to make sure that readers knew that this was sort of in the past. Uh, and uh, so I, so I pinned it around the Vancouver um, uh, Olympics. I, it, it's set in Ottawa, but people are are referring to the Vancouver Olympics fairly frequently, and there's. There's, you know, stuff that happens that's that that it's not really directly related to the Vancouver Olympics, but that's the thing that's happening in the background, so that readers can remember that we're in 2010 rather than 2023. Um, although uh, you call it the Dominion Archive series, you have different protagonists. Um, so let's talk about uh, the protagonist for the foulest thing. Uh, that is. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember her name. I have it written down somewhere, but uh, yeah, no that's a, a new, a brand new archivist um, who's new to the industry. Uh, so, what's her story? Yeah. So, um, the foulest things is first person, and it centers around Jess Novak, who's this young archivist who's just started her career. She's very anxious. She loves archives and is very anxious to be successful in her career. She has a terrible boss. She's got you know all those sort of early career concerns and worries plaguing her and, and challenges, and she's very anxious to prove herself. Um, and uh, she, uh, on her first big project that she's given, she does a, makes a terrible mistake and sort of rips uh, a ledger that she's working on and discovers that she hasn't in fact ripped it, that there's a slit in there and there are some letters, there's some secret hidden letters. And so Jess then spends the rest of the novel um, untangling the mystery that these letters represent. They, they're actually from uh, the, the date from just the start of the First World War in Paris is, is where these letters are coming from. And so she has to sort of track that down. And very quickly in the course of tracking down that mystery, it embroils her in a present day murder that has happened on the on the archives present uh, premises. And so she's, the two are intertwined and she has to solve the historical mystery in order to understand the, the present day mystery. And yeah. That's, that's her story. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm sure in chronologically, as you wrote the story and didn't get it published and you're just like, oh, it's not going to work for Novak. Now that it's been published, now that it's been, um, well, now nominated for awards, mm -hmm. any thoughts of going back? Because I know you time jump to the next series. So is there any thoughts of, well, maybe I'll take a step back and visit her again, or is she done? No, I, I really would like to. And I... I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I'm just feeling this whole process of being a writer out and, you know, trying to figure out what, what this looks like for me. And so um, I got it, uh, Foulest Things got some good reviews when it was published and people, people were always commenting on, oh, you know, we love Jess. She's such a great, she's such a great protagonist. We can't wait to see her next adventures. And my heart sort of sinks every time that I see that I'm happy, but because then, because 
because of this weird publishing history these books have, it is an entirely new protagonist in the next book. And so I was like, oh no, <laughs> my legions of fans are gonna be devastated that they don't see Jess right away. So I do think if, if I get to continue with the series, I would like to combine the protagonist from the next book from Speak for the Dead and Jess and have them uh, you know, meet up and, uh, and solve, solve a mystery together or something, or I don't, you know, who knows, maybe they won't get along, but uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that that does sound like a fun project because um, it is the same world, right? They, they are That's, in the same world. Yeah, um, the, the connecting is the archives, and, yeah. and and then some of the characters do pop into different different books. Although I guess, yeah. Oh, so some of the archives, some of the characters are the same because people would be asking then, well, what happened to Jess? Then why isn't she there ten years later? <laughs> but you're gonna have to make yeah. up something interesting for that, right? Well, I do. I have it explained. <laughs> she she gets the mentions, but she's not she's not around. But she she will be, I think. Oh, okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So then you've got like a creative new world to um, work with. Um, you said something that uh, I think some people might scratch their head is that she loves archives. Um, to be upfront with you too, I used to work for Transport Canada in information management. Okay. I may, we may have like sent correspondence to each other. But <laughs> yes, <what? laughs> it's like, could you find this file for me, please? <laughs> and um, I, I've been to the archives just in Vancouver. Um and they're they're quite big. They're all, it's not exactly the same, but it's similar to the end of like Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think it's just <laughs> massive, massive warehouse of just old files back when we used to keep paper. Yeah. Um, does does that th that unique feeling of being an archivist searching for mysteries constantly on a regular basis? I remember the same thing, trying to search for a box that somebody filed 30 years ago. Does that find its way into your stories? Yeah, yeah, my um, <laughs> my sis, my little sister is one of my beta readers always, and she's uh, has nothing to do with archives, and it's you know it's a <laughs> a mean little sister, let's say, not always <laughs> wonderful, but she's blunt. She 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 she's not shy with me, and so she read she read the foulest things, and she was like, hmm, "There's a lot about archives, but it's not boring." <laughs> <laughs> That's like, Thanks, I guess. So yeah, like the the archives, like I've I've spent my career in archives. I find it really interesting. I know that most people don't don't really they have a hazy understanding of what it is. They don't really understand it. And so I love and I teach as well as you mentioned. So I I you know I talk to twenty year olds about about archives and and how exciting and wonderful they can be and what they exactly that what 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 information they hold that people aren't even aware of and how. Part of what's exciting about archives is that it's not easy. You can't keyword search and find, find what yes. you want. It's, they're not accessible via Google. And that more and more is just, um, you know, uh, uh, like mind blowing to people because we're so used. And even I am like, oh, why can't I just Google this? But um, <laughs> so absolutely, I wanted to make sure that I could immerse the readers in this world that I feel like a lot of people don't know about, but have an interest in. Because if you're interested in history or you're interested in storytelling, I think a lot of people have these ideas about what archives are and some of them are romantic and a little bit wrong but some of them are actually true and that idea that there are secrets in the archives is true it's not because the archivists want to keep them secret but it's just it's how how this information is organized and even in the digital age even with everything you know becoming electronic it's still managing information as it sounds so boring but it actually is is, is fascinating and there's so much that that is yeah. tucked away that is that, that is worth looking for yeah i remember one case and i get, you know most people aren't going to relate to this but i remember it was a case where we said the water line was at this level at one point 30 years ago and the plaintiff uh, was like we'll prove it <laughs> It's not an easy thing to do. Like we kept such different records there before. And you, I was like asking people at your end for like, give me this box. Maybe it's in this box. And, yeah, and then yeah, you yeah. wait, like people don't used, they're used to waiting anymore, but you wait like a week or something and that box arrives and you fish through it and it's there. And you're like, it's one of the greatest yeah. feelings. So, yeah, yes, it is a mystery in itself, but it's not one that most people are ever going to know, especially kids yeah. <laughs> with their like yeah. three seconds, where's the answer? <laughs> Well, but they if anybody wants to do archival research, they will always experience that if, if they're doing anything sort of pre, you know, 2010, because it's still all paper and it's never all going to be digitized. So this, so you're always, if you're doing any kind of deeper archival research, you're always at some point going to have to be opening boxes and looking at 
so you so you do anybody can experience that kind of fun if they have a project they can go to the archives and start treasure hunting really <laughs> is what it is exciting uh well let's do you a favor let's talk about speak for the dead so that's a yeah. brand well not brand new series but brand new protagonist in the same world um could you tell us a little bit about that one yeah so this was like i explained it was the second mystery that i wrote and so in the first mystery we had sort of this this dewy-eyed um, Jess, who's brand new to things and is sort of looking around and very naive and excited. Um, and so when I wrote my second novel, I was like, well, I'm gonna try to have a different protagonist. And so I went, I created Kate, who's really in a lot of ways, the polar opposite. She is a, um, a crusty, funny, bitingly funny, sarcastic, uh, lonely woman who doesn't have friends really. And, um, uh, and, and is very intelligent, but, but but difficult prickly she's a prickly person uh and uh she's a coroner so she's a medical doctor because that's in ontario coroners are medical doctors um but but her specialty is uh being a coroner and so she's called out to um a dominion archives building so that's the that's the way into the archival world and it's not the sort of regular building where where the researchers go but it's this 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 really out of the way kind of abandoned looking derelict building that turns out to be um, a vault, a series of vaults that contain nitrate film, which is this extremely, um, uh, it was an extremely popular uh, a medium upon which uh, photographs and film was taken for about 50 years. But as it turns out, it's terrible for storage. And it, um, when it degrades, it becomes ext it's extremely flammable to the point where it can spontaneously combust. And the fires that it creates are extremely problematic. So we've, we've seen it in pop popular culture a few times, like with the uh, cinema Paradiso and uh, Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. Those all yeah. feature uh, terrible fires as a result of this nitrate film. Anyway, Kate, the cynical coroner, gets called out to what's an apparent suicide. Uh, and she quickly thinks um, that it isn't. She she suspects murder. Uh, the police are not on board. They they want to wrap this thing up quickly, so they don't want this pesky coroner muddying their very simple case. But um, Jess's co uh, not Jess <laughs> the victim's coworker um, uh, agrees with Kate, and so together they t and she's an archivist, and so together they team up to try to untangle. What what has happened to uh, to this to this um, uh, this murder victim? And uh, in order to solve this mystery, similar to the foulest things, they need to they need to delve into the past a little bit. They need to visit the archives. They and they, you know there's other issues at play as well. And so they they do their investigation um, all sort of whilst working in this very dangerous environment of these these nitrate um, with this nitrate film that is um, highly volatile. Wow, sounds like quite the adventure. <laughs> and that's that's pulling a little bit from real life too, I think, right? For yourself, but then yeah, you? I, I mean, both both these archives books were inspired by my time working at Library and Archives Canada. Though I always say this is <laughs> the Dominion Archives is not LAC. That's not how we don't work this way. None of my colleagues are murderers, but I think, but um, but yeah. So so this so setting the setting really inspired was inspired from real life for me um because i was a photo archivist at one point and i was responsible for moving canada's national collection of nitrate film from a, a building an inappropriate building that where this material was housed to our brand new facility uh, so i definitely called upon that and then the other aspect is that i was i am lucky enough to have one of my sisters uh, be a coroner and so she was able to um to really help me with all the all the cornering uh aspects of the story which was really helpful yeah, I love talking to authors who wrote a book that only they could write. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think I think you so far you've written two that only you could have written. Uh, and um, you said that it was a three book series. So there's another book. Yeah, uh, so I've got another book in the in the, with the publishers or yeah with the publishers now. So it's it's starting the editorial process, and hopefully that'll come out in spring 2024, and that'll be the third in the Dominion Archives. Uh, series and it will feature Kate um, again, the coroner, but still with an archival element and with characters from both books making appearances. Sounds exciting. So we're going to have to get used to actually waiting maybe a year to read. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm really grateful because it's just like, whoa, that was a, a really busy year last year. <laughs> so I'm quite happy to have a bit of time now. Excellent. Well, best of luck. Um, the awards are, uh, you're going to have to wait another three weeks or so, but it may uh, 25th. And um, well, I say it to everybody, but I'll be rooting for you. I'm so grateful for the, uh, for the organization, for the, for the award. It's such an honor. Excellent. Thank you everyone for watching.